All right, we're uh, looks like we're still missing uh, missing three people, but I'm inclined to just get started here and see since uh, we're a bit after uh, twelve thirty now. Uh, so today's lecture is a bit of a it's a little bit of a break from the math. Uh, what I kind of want to do today is just do some things that kind of fall into the advanced geometrical optics context. Uh, in particular, discuss, you know, most of our optics that we focus on in this class is really uh, optics for, you know, with application to the physics lab and the general physics and physical properties of light. But at some point you should you know, learn some of the terminology and some of the ideas that go into photography, camera lenses, photographic lenses, et cetera. And uh, so that's one thing I wanna talk about today. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about, which is uh, not something that can be modeled with ray matrices, are things called lens aberrations. These are ways in which lenses violate the laws of uh, ray optics. And generally, this is due to uh, one of the assumptions we made not holding. Like, for instance, uh, for spherical lenses, rays don't always hit at small angles relative to the optical axis. And this uh, causes focusing and imaging to not be perfect. And uh, I want to talk a bit about the effects of that. So. Uh, overall, there'll be a little bit of math in this lecture, but it's generally less mathematical than what we just did and less mathematical than what we'll do next week. So it's a little bit of a nice breather uh, lecture. All right. So one thing you hear about a lot if you're interested in photography is a property of a lens called the F number. And this is written as, the F number is written as F slash pound sign or hashtag or whatever you call that thing. So this is, this is read F, uh, if I use my laser pointer here, this symbol is read F number. And this is defined as the ratio of the lens's focal length to its diameter. So the focal length F is here, the diameter would be this distance, you guys can see that from, if the two are equal, that's an F number equal to one. If uh, the diameter is half of the focal length, that's the F number of, that's an F number of two. This is also often called the F stop. So this idea is that basically it's a measure of how much light a lens collects. So bigger lenses collect more light and thus the bigger the F number of the lens, the more intensity you'll get uh, at the film or the CCD chip, what have you, if you're using this lens to focus an image. So basically, uh, Smaller, smaller F numbers collect more rays of light. So I think I just said that in reverse. Uh, so smaller F number means you collect more light. Another property that uh, photographers care about when discussing lenses is this thing called depth of field. So what this is, is uh, basically, if you think of a lens and like we did in lab, if you make an image of an object that's you know, in focus. So we have our object here and we use a converging lens to make a real image, maybe on, on our camera film or CCD chip. Uh, there's a particular image position associated with that. But in actuality, if you're a photographer, stuff that's like just right behind the object or just in front of the object might be a bit blurry, but it might be almost in focus. You might almost get a good image. So there's, in reality, there's really a range of 
distances over which you have an acceptable focus. And those are the things that you could kind of get, all of the stuff that you can get in focus in a photograph would be considered to be within the, uh, the lens's depth of field. So the depth of field is the distance, maybe it would go from like, uh, for instance, maybe objects between this distance and this distance are more or less acceptably in focus. That distance here is the depth of field for the lens. And this depends on the lens's aperture, how wide it is. So effectively it's diameter. We'll see there's a relationship then between the F number of a lens and how big this depth of field is. And it's important when you're considering, uh, if you're a photographer and you're trying to take a portrait versus a landscape photography, you might want a different depth of field. So for instance here, let's say we have an object that's a little bit before our in-focus object. So really that, that object will focus and make an image somewhere out here. But if our film or our digital camera chip is located at this position, this object will be a bit blurred. But if that blur is acceptable so that we could still tell what it is, it's within the depth of field for the lens. Obviously what that is, there's a this is a bit subjective. But easy to see if you uh, use something to lower the aperture or lower the size of the lens, maybe by putting like a block in front of it, some sort, or maybe in, like in lab, one of our iris apertures where you could change the opening size. The smaller the aperture, the less blurry the lens, the less blurry the uh, almost in focus image. So decreasing the aperture uh, will usually increase the uh, depth of field a bit. And that's because you're going to have, if you have more rays that you're trying to converge, uh, the blur is going to be bigger at any distance than for less rays. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. Those smaller apertures will give uh, a more acceptably focused image. It will be dimmer, of course, but it will be less out of focus. This is why, for instance, uh, if you wear glasses or contacts and you don't have them on or in, if you squint, uh, you might get, you might be able to see more clearly. So if you take off your glasses and you squint, you might be able to see more clearly than you do if you have your eyes open fully. Uh, this is that same effect that you're seeing. So even without your glasses, if you squint uh, or you look through a very small aperture, you might be able to see things more clear clearly, but what you see will be dimmer. So what this means is that larger F number means bigger depth of field for a photographer. As kind of an example of what this looks like. So good photographic lenses, so good lenses on uh, cameras, uh, you have the ability to change the F number. And basically in a uh, photographic camera lens, you have one of those iris apertures that we would use in lab built in. And usually by turning the cylinder on the outside of the camera lens, you could change the size of that aperture and thus change the F number of the overall photographic lens. So for here, for small F number, you really just have a very small plane of the image in focus. But if you increase the F number, you'll see things further away, things out of the image plane start becoming clearer and clearer. So depending on what you want to do artistically, uh, if you want to focus on just one particular object or maybe a whole landscape, you will change the F number of your lens. So if you want to, you know, a large depth of field isn't always what you want. Sometimes if you want to do, especially if you want to do like a portrait photography, you might want a very small depth of field. So it means a very large F number. So here, here we have a very large aperture lens that causes the uh, photograph to really just focus in and zoom in 
on the thing we care about, which is the flower. Uh, here you kind of have the background that's kind of in focus, but not really. And that's more or less distracting from the actual focus of the photograph. So uh, these decisions aren't really scientific decisions, they're more artistic decisions. But it's all uh, how you change this is by changing the aperture size of your lens. So if you have a really uh, very large aperture lens, you could get photographs like this where, you know, the background is entirely completely blurred and you're entirely focused on just the object you care about. If you want a lens that could get like apertures this large, uh, generally we're talking about lenses that cost thousands of dollars and they're compound lenses. They're made of multiple different lenses inside for reasons we'll talk about in a bit. Usually to change the F number, if you could see here on the side of this lens, you'll see that the F numbers, there's, these, there's this cylinder you can turn that changes that iris aperture inside the lens. And these markings on the side are markings that tell you what F number you have. So if you have a friend who's a photographer or you're a photographer, this is what you're doing when you're uh, changing, uh, when you're changing this property of the lens, you're changing its aperture size. Just some pretty pictures, very small depth of field. These are all thanks to uh, Professor Rick Trebino at Georgia State. So take a second, look at it, it's pretty. Here's another one. Ooh, ah. Yay, art. Okay. So continuing with like the artistic focus uh, of some of these properties, another artistic property of photography is called bokeh. And this is basically how uh, out of focus light sources look in a photograph. So you want to design your photograph such that something that's deliberately out of focus, hopefully it shouldn't distract from the stuff that's in focus. So you want out of focus stuff to at least subjectively not distract the person looking at your picture. So basically, uh, photographers have kind of made the decision that what we call Good bokeh is kind of a Gaussian blur of things that are out of focus. So something that is out of focus should be kind of not defined at the edges, but be brighter in the center. The thing you definitely don't want is something opposite to this. Meaning that the edges are more defined than the center of the object. And depending on the aperture size, you can get situations and the focus of the lens, you can get situations like this. So this is really, we're not really talking about science at this point. In fact, you know, uh, getting this type of effect where you have a Gaussian blur is really due to an aberration in the lens, something where it's not following the laws of ray optics. So here we're, when we're talking about photography, it's, uh, we're almost into a range where we're talking more art than science at the moment. So some examples of this, so I'll give you, you know, the property of neutral blur, neutral bokeh is sometimes not all that bad, but these photographs on the right are where you have, you know, the edges of these out of, of these blurred light sources, out of focus light sources are way more defined than the center. And in some people's opinion, that's bad. I'm being a bit facetious here. I mean, it's, uh, it's very subjective, but uh, hopefully you get the idea of what that means. So 
let's talk about some of the ways in which you get these different focusing properties from aberrations in lenses. So again, an aberration is some way in which a lens doesn't really follow the basic laws of ray optics. So one of the common properties you'll hear about is, for instance, you can have lenses that have a focal length along one direction or in one plane that's different than the other. So instead of focusing rays down to a point, it might focus them down to a line where you know, you're focused on one direction rather than another. And these things, lenses that are designed to do this uh, because we want them to do that are called cylindrical lenses. Often a purely cylindrical lens will focus in one direction and not focus at all in the other direction. So you get your light sources focused down to a line rather than a point. So as you can see here, these are some examples of cylindrical lenses. The curved surface looks like it's cut from a cylinder. So hence the name. And this lens here uh, will focus in the vertical direction, the direction in which my mouse is moving. Whereas this lens here would focus in the horizontal direction. If you remember using those, uh, if you did the ray optics in the intro physics lab where you had the, the lenses on the, you had the, the box with, that gave you five laser beams and you, used the lens, you put the lens down in front of them and they focused on the you know, white circular table underneath it. Those, were, those are effectively cylindrical lenses. Uh, we could also have cylindrical curved mirrors that, you know, focus light, they reflect and focus light, just like a lens, uh, except that they invert the optical axis. Uh, some effects here, there's a uh, one uh, London skyscraper that actually acts like a, uh, given how it's built, it acts like a cylindrical mirror, actually focus light to uh, Someone melted a car before it was completed. I don't quite know how they fixed it. Uh, there's another hotel in Las Vegas called the Vegas Death Ray that focuses sun onto sunbathers at the pool below. Uh, and that's kind, of, that's kind of built like that by design to be a cylindrical mirror. So, but cylindrical lenses or mirrors, uh, they don't necessarily focus uh, for rays that are very off axis. So very much off the optical axis, have a large angle with respect to it. Those things will break cylindrical symmetry and cause things to focus in a different way. So for instance here, uh, you have to consider like different kinds of rays in this system and whether they uh, have a large angle in plane or out of plane. So here the, the ray that's in plane, but at an angle to the optical axis uh, is this red ray. The green ray is kind of drawn to, it's coming in from behind the plane of the slide right now, hits the mirror and then comes out towards us somewhat. That's called this, uh, sagittal ray. Not quite sure on the pronunciation there. But in both of these directions, the uh, uh, cylindrical mirror uh, will not bring these to the same focus. So it kind of, these things do break symmetry in that sense. Other types of aberrations that you could have and that we can uh, see are for instance, here, some, uh, so our original object is this letter E here, which we might look at. So we'll talk about uh, what a lot of these are, but you can't model them with ray matrices. They're, they're all kind of caused by the fact that uh, that, for instance, things that we're breaking the assumptions we made. So for instance, here, spherical aberration is this kind of all around spherical blur that you get on your object in an image. And it's always there if you're using a lens that has spherical surfaces. 
the reason why this happens is because not all rays are at angles, at small angles relative to the optical axis. The rays at large angles don't focus to the same focal point as the rays at small angles. So it leads to this slightly out of focus image. If you want, it's possible to correct for spherical aberration, uh, but what you have to do is cut the surface of the lenses to be in the shape of a paraboloid. So you have to use a parabolic lens. Uh, the other way to beat some of these is to use multiple lenses where uh, the aberrations end up canceling out. Another type of aberration is what we call uh, chromatic aberration. And this is when different colors of light fo have different focal points. Uh, so this always, this happens with most glasses. Uh, so most glasses that we would make lens out of, they have different indices of refraction for red light versus blue light, as we learned earlier in the semester. There is this dispersion effect uh, in basically all materials. So for instance, if you wanna work out the focal length of the lens using the, uh, the lens maker's equation as shown here, it's going to be different. Uh, the focal length will depend on wavelength because the index depends on wavelength. And if you just had one lens and you tried to make an image uh, using a camera, which is one lens, you would get something that looks like this, where you see, especially near the edges of objects, red and blue light are kind of being separated. And some are in focus, some are not. And you get this kind of rainbow effect around the edges of objects in your image. And this happens with all types of glass. But if you guys have used any type of good digital camera, even the camera on your phone, we don't see this happening. So there's obviously a way to fix this. How do we do it? And that is called, uh, the way we fix that is by using two lens together in a compound lens configuration. It's called an achromat lens. And there's generally one of these in, all in all photographic lens uh, systems. So here, for instance, uh, the way you would do this uh, is that you would need two different types of glasses with different indices of refraction. Uh, both of the materials have positive dispersion, but what we do is we use uh, a different type of glass to make a diverging lens that we place after our converging lens. So what that does is slow down it, it ends up slowing down the focus of the blue light more than the red light, and it cancels out the, uh, it brings the two focal lengths for red and blue in line with each other. The two types of glass that are usually used are called crown glass and plinth glass. Uh, I think later on, maybe next week, I'm going to assign a problem where you guys are working through this. I still have to put it together though. Uh, it's the one uh, aberration problem that you can kind of work through using a in like a re an amount of time that's reasonable and you can learn something from it. So it's not on the current homework set, but it might be on the next one. But it's a common thing in uh, photographic lens systems uh, to have this achromat because otherwise your images end up having this uh, rainbow dispersion effect. So this is kind of a cartoon image of spherical aberration. So you'll see that the, uh, for spherical aberration, we just don't get a clear focus point because rays near the center, maybe these three rays, focus here. While as this ray and this ray focus closer in. As you move further out with the rays, the focal points get closer and closer. So spherical aberration is all due to the fact that the distance of the light ray, the rays are not hitting near the center of the lens. They're not hitting near the optical axis. Anytime their distance uh, from the center of the lens or their angle from the optical axis is really large, you'll get spherical aberration. And if you look at this, if you kind of took images or you placed your screen after the lens at the focal point, that would be position B here. You'd see something like this. You'd see a mostly well-defined image, but there would be this overall spherical blur around the outside. 
if you're close in, if you're closer to the lens than its theoretical focal point, that's position A. What you'll see is something like this, where you see kind of circular fringes. If you're further out at position C, further out than the focal point of the lens, it would be more of a Gaussian blur. So something where you're brighter in the center and weaker at the outside. And again, unlike chromatic aberration, this is just something we're stuck with unless we're going to, uh, unless we're going to use lenses cut with parabolic surfaces, at which point we can do that. And in a lot of, uh, in a lot of situations we do. However, the problem there is that the mathematics and the geometry become much more complicated. The lens maker's equation as we have it written in terms of radius of the spherical surface no longer applies. You instead have to use, uh, you'll have a different equation for paraboloidal or uh, hyperbolic shaped surfaces that is much more complicated. But if we want to get really clear, very well-defined images, uh, then that might be something we have to do. Uh, it's also something we could do with mirrors that we curve mirrors that are used to focus light. So for instance, if we have a mirror cut on the shape of a sphere, we'll have the same effect where rays that are hitting closer to the outside focus closer than rays hitting towards the inside. And we get this blur. We don't really get a well-defined focal point. Though if we did the same simulation or drawing with a uh, mirror cut in a parabolic surface, we can get rid of spherical aberration. We also hear uh, focusing light rays with curved mirrors is another way to get around chromatic aberration because we don't need to actually use, uh, it's all bent, all we're using here is the law of reflection rather than Snell's law. So the fact that we don't need to worry about index of refraction depending on wavelength. So focusing with a parabolic shaped mirror is one of the ways we can get around both spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. And in a lot of uh, optics lab settings or in a lot of uh, very precise imaging devices, you'll see that uh, par parabolic mirrors are preferred over lenses for this reason. However, they're harder to make, they are more expensive, and they are a lot more troublesome to align in your system. Uh, one of the, if you uh, end up working in an optics lab in graduate school, one of the first most annoying things you have to do is figure out how to align a parabolic mirror correctly. It's a bit beyond the scope of our class, but it's something every optics graduate student has to struggle with. So here, of course, the parabolic mirror, this situation only works for the reason why the alignment is so hard is because you really need to have the light rays coming in at an incident angle of zero. If you're at an angle relative to the parabola, uh, then we start getting different aberrations that come in and we lose our good focal point. Yeah, so in, often in telescopes, for instance, you wanna get a nice good uh, uh, focused image. Uh, but spherical surfaces are not used for that reason because we don't really have, we need to be so precise that having this not well-defined focal point is a problem. Historically, one of the places where this came up in, uh, in the you know, history of science or physics uh, is in the design of the original Hubble telescope. I don't know if you guys know this story at all, but the Hubble telescope required not just parabolic mirrors, but mirrors that were shaped along a hyperbola shape to minimize aberrations. And the original mirror was machined uh, to be near the edge edges. It was just four microns off from the shape it should have been, from the ideal hyperbola curve. So again, they, they use this mirror to focus light as our, the mirror te technically replaces the first lens in the telescope. And this was to get rid of chromatic aberration and the shape is to get rid of spherical aberration. 
But the fact that it was four microns off uh, from the ideal shape meant that we still had aberrations in there. So you would get you know, rays focusing at different focal points. And it resulted in a fuzzy focus, so much so that the difference uh, between the images you would get with the Hubble looked like this. So the original image was here. And then uh, a few years after they put the Hubble into space, they did a second mission, space shuttle mission to throw in another correcting mirror into the system that canceled out these aberrations and uh, then fixed the images to the images that we know and love from the Hubble today. Uh, so I think it's kind of a cool story in that, I mean, I guess if you're the machinist that was four microns off and then you, know, you send a multi-billion dollar telescope into orbit only to find out that it didn't work because of those, that four micron difference. It's probably not as good of a story from that perspective, but from our perspective, not being involved in the project, it's a, a neat way to see aberrations and the effects of, that aberrations could have. Uh, Aberrations uh, in lenses and trying to correct for them are also, that's why we have these different types of lenses uh, that you saw in lab. So, you know, we have these biconvex lenses, or we also have lenses that are flat on one side. Uh, and these are all basically the reason these different lenses are made are made for, uh, they're made for situations where uh, your tolerance to aberrations are different. So for instance, by using a plano convex lens, uh, you only have to deal with two spherical surfaces. Uh, and if the two spherical surfaces are facing inward together, uh, you get overall less aberration than you would get from the two spherical surfaces on the biconvex lens that are facing outward. So uh, these are things that people studying geometrical optics have been working on for you know, probably hundreds of years now. And uh, these different types of lenses are basically designed to get around this imaging problem. You can also combine, uh, you know, there are ways to combine the different shapes of lenses. So for instance, you could have a biconvex lens of crown glass and then a meniscus lens uh, made of flint glass that kind of fits directly onto your onto your first lens and you could design an achromat that uh, where the two lenses can be actually touching. So that's another use to these different shapes of lenses that we have. And by combining these two achromats together to get the most spherical surfaces inside, we can eliminate or reduce spherical aberrations as much as possible as well. So it's basically correcting for these deviations from the theory of ge geometrical optics or ray optics, uh, trying to correct for these things is the reason why we have developed all these different types of lenses. And again, if this was a, a course on geometrical optics, we would spend much more time on this. But again, we're, we have other things we need to focus on in physics as well. So it's, this is really gonna be the one lecture where we talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, one final word on this. Uh, a st this thing called astigmatism, which was the property of cylindrical lenses that focus light more in one direction than another. So really what this means is that if you have rays, so like here, we might have a lens, uh, even that is not shaped, it, it might not be a cylindrical lens by design. Maybe we meant it to be a spherical lens, but the shape was off on one axis relative to the other. So light that hits the lens along the vertical axis might focus here. Whereas light that hits the lens along the horizontal axis will might focus further away. So this is a point where you never really get a nice, clear, well-defined focus. You get something, this overall effect, there's somewhere in the middle called the circle of least confusion, which is one of my favorite names of all things in physics. We all just want to be within the circle of least confusion at all times in our life in physics. Uh, and sometimes we get there, sometimes we don't. But at this point, this is the best, the thing you get that's closest to a focus. 
off of this, the image is kind of stretched in one direction or another. If you're behind, in this case, as is drawn, if you're behind, the image is stretched more vertically than horizontally. If you're right before this point, then stretched more horizontally than vertically. And you see this effect a lot when you're trying to align parabolic mirrors if the angle is off. So one of the big problems with parabolic mirrors is if they're not aligned precisely, they focus things astigmatically. The way you, you like cure or fix this is by using another sphere cylindrical lens that has the opposite distortion. So you kind of have to have put another lens in front of this where the way this lens is distorted along the horizontal direction, that lens needs to be distorted along the vertical direction. And the two effects will end up canceling out. The reason I use the language cure here is because, of course, astigmatism is a problem that happens in the eye a lot. It's a medical problem and a vision problem that people experience all the time. So if you, you might be nearsighted or farsighted, but you may also be aware that from your prescription, your eye is also, also has astigmatism. And generally, the way this is experienced is that you see things that are blurry, but usually the blur is along one axis in your eye. It might be horizontal, it might be vertical, it might be at an angle in your image, in your vision, but the blur is kind of more along one direction than the other. And that's due to the fact that the lens on the front of your eye is not perfectly spherical in shape. And it just depends on the luck of the draw, and genetics, and how your eyes developed. But the way we correct for that is the glasses or contacts you wear will end up canceling out that asymmetry. So that other lens will be designed such that the overall, like if you imagine you put a contact in your eye, that contact is designed to make the overall compound lens, the contact plus the lens in your eye, to have spherical symmetry and it cancels out this aberration. The last kind of uh, uh, aberration, the last aberration I'm gonna talk about is this thing called coma. And this causes, what this causes is off-axis rays, so rays that are really far from, it's different than spherical aberration, but it's uh, from rays that are far from the optical axis focus at a different point vertically. So it stretches out the, uh, the light, the focus of the light in along different directions. So you can kind of see that here, the optical axis is uh, this line going kind of through the lens here to the screen. And the further away light gets from the lens, uh, from the center of the lens, it focuses, it doesn't focus as much, but it wants to focus off axis here. And the reason it's called coma, it kind of relates to uh, to comets in a sense. It creates kind of like a comet-like tail to the image. So it looks like it's kind of stretched out and it gets wider as you move up. So you see this a lot in uh, astronomical images where I, where I think the term comes from. So often this is corrected by, you can tilt the lens a bit. So like tilt it, uh, Kind of if we looked at one of these lenses here, if you tilt it along the horizontal, uh, or sorry, along the vertical direction just a bit, you can uh, at least partially correct it just with that small adjustment. Oh yeah, I forgot, I do have a few more. So another one is that uh, sometimes a lens can create a, a focal position or a focal length that is curved. So rays that are at large angles, and this is again, uh, kind of do the focal points being at different positions. The overall effect might be that it curves the clear image. Uh, this is kind of a problem if you're trying to build a camera with a flat CCD chip that picks up this light, but since the back of our eye is curved, this is actually a good effect. So our eye, the spherical uh, nature of the shape of our eye 
makes use of the fact that the spherical aberration of the lens produces this curved image. Uh, and our, the back of our retina is designed to pick up this, to be curved, to pick up this clear image as much as possible. What this, depending on the type of lens, uh, the curved image might curve outward or inward. And photographers call that pin cushion distortion. If uh, the center of the image looks further away than the outside, or barrel distortion if the center looks closer than the outside. And usually you can correct for these things with combinations of different lenses. To correct for this effect, uh, these are called orthoscopic doublets. So things here, again, they're combinations of diverging lenses and converging lenses. Few examples of this effect. So the barrel distortion is this first image. The pin cushion will be is the second. So you can see the outside, the pin cushion, the outside looks like it's closer than the inside for the house. Yeah, there's also this other thing going on, which is just like a geometrical or perception effect. Things further to the outside, things uh, on the roof of the house here look closer together and smaller. Uh, but so they appear closer together, but that's only because they're further away. So this, that's also going on in this image. But the main point of the image here is to show you the pincushion effect. So photographic lenses are built from these like combination of lenses, and there's lots of different designs uh, that correct for all these different distortions, whether it be pincushion or barrel distortion, chromatic aberration, spherical aberration. Photographic lenses can be made from lots and lots of different uh, elements, sometimes as many as 20. Uh, and they're all combined to end up canceling out different effects. So these outer lenses, some of them are going to be made with extra low dispersion glass, others are a spherical. There's combinations of converging and diverging lenses. So like for instance here, this might be our achromat lens to correct for chromatic dispersion. Uh, these might be our lenses to counteract spherical aberration. Then we might have over here lenses to counter our uh, counter our uh, pin cushion or barrel distortion. And this is somewhat getting out of my personal area of expertise for optics, but I think you guys should kind of know why there are all these different uh, lenses that are designed in these systems. Last thing you might, I think this is kind of like a cool thing to know is how these viewfinders on cameras work. So it's kind of neat because it uses a, it usually uses a prism and a total internal reflection to give you a, to give you an image of what you look at outside the camera. So, so usually inside the camera, there's a little mirror here. This thing here will be the CCD chip that collects the light. Uh, but before you hit the, uh, you know, the button on the camera to take the picture, uh, this mirror will reflect the light up into the prism and give you an image from the viewfinder. But then when, if you've ever used a camera, if you hit a button, you'll notice when uh, the shutter opens on the camera, you can't, for a moment there, you can't see anything through the viewfinder. And that's because usually this, uh, this mirror will flip down and allow the light to hit the camera sensor for a brief period of time. Uh, and these are called single lens reflex or SLR cameras. Yeah, newer cameras, you know, use different, they use LCD uh, viewfinders to see 
to get the same effect so they have less moving parts. So this is kind of an older idea, but it kind of combines different ideas from optics. So it's worth kind of seeing. There's also these things, these autofocus sensors. So if you've used a camera and that has autofocus, uh, those things work kind of neat. It's a, a neat little image processing, but also optics problem. So generally what happens is autofocus uses this thing called phase detection. So what it does is it actually makes sense of, uh, it uses some of these, uh, really, these rays that are really hitting near the edges of the lens that come from our object. So let's say that this camera lens represents those like 20 lenses or whatever that are in our system. And what, uh, what the autofocus does is change the effective aperture to the lens. So back here, we'll have a automated iris aperture or something that we can change. And these light rays hit our uh, CCD screen. And if the external rays, if we're collecting too many rays, uh, we'll get a blurred image because they'll kind of hit at different points. And then through, you know, a mixture of programming and uh, controlling automatically the size of this aperture, the camera sensor can move the aperture until eventually these light rays eventually line up. And at that point, that gives us, that will give us an image for all the rays in the center. When we let them through, they should focus well. So kind of a neat idea and you could get using this automated pr procedure kind of find what we call the front focus and the back focus which more or less this allows us to find our effective depth of field so kind of a cool little idea but it's really i think in some ways there's a little bit of optics here but i think the image processing and the programming problem collecting the data and analyzing this in real time is really the more interesting idea Uh, so from there, I think uh, that's what I plan to do with you guys today. When we get back on, uh, on Monday, what we're going to start doing is talking about interference and diffraction. And in particular, what I want to do and go over with you guys is a lot of the details of the theory of the Michelson interferometer and how you actually build it and align it to get fringes that you can see, uh, that you, the fringes that you talked about in modern physics. and. So we're gonna go into the uh, theory of that next, and that will start on Monday. Uh, however, next week, uh, I might need an extra day to talk about this. I was originally going to have you guys build a Michelson interferometer in, in lab, uh, but obviously we won't be able to do that now. Uh, but given the amount of time I wanna spend on the theory, I think we might end up having to meet during the lab section to discuss the theory next week. So I'm not sure yet, but Plan to keep that time open Tuesday at one o'clock to do a little bit more of lecture, if that's possible. Uh, so if there aren't any questions, then uh, that'll be it for today. You guys have a good weekend and I'll talk to you on Monday.